Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we continue our tour of Hollywood Forever Cemetery, where we'll find such stars as Rudolph Valentino, Estelle Getty, Douglas Fairbanks, and many more. Join us, won't you? Continuing our tour of Hollywood Forever Cemetery, we'll be visiting the remaining mausoleums and the grounds in between. The first mausoleum constructed at Hollywood Forever is the Cathedral Mausoleum, built in 1919 and designed in an Italian Renaissance style. It was originally called the Hollywood Mausoleum, its in-demand crypts quickly selling out. The mausoleum has undergone many expansions over the years, allowing for more and more entombments. The Beth Olam Mausoleum is located in the southwest corner of the cemetery. Beth Olam was originally a separate Jewish cemetery, but is now the Jewish section of Hollywood Forever. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out Part 1. This is where we'll pick up our tour, just down the street from where we left off at Part 1. Let's head into the entrance of the Beth Olam Mausoleum just off this main road. Right of the piano, in the main foyer, is the crypt of film composer Victor Young. He was nominated for an incredible 22 Academy Awards in his career for films like For Whom the Bell Tolls, Samson and Delilah, and The Quiet Man. He holds the record for the most nominations before winning, 21. He finally won in 1956 for his score for Around the World in 80 Days, but sadly didn't live to see it. He died months earlier, making the award posthumous. Fans of the Rocky movies will recognize this corridor on the right from the scene where Mickey's funeral took place in Rocky III. The Imaru. The Imaru. Or me. Or me. Or me. Shalom. Shalom. Halfway down this second corridor is mobster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. He was known as one of the most notorious and ruthless gangsters of his day. This, combined with his good looks and charisma, made him a celebrity of a different sort. In the 30s, he headed a criminal empire on the West Coast, and was a fixture in Hollywood social scenes. Siegel counted many Hollywood stars among his friends, including Cary Grant and Jean Harlow, who was godmother to his daughter Millicent. He was known for extorting money from movie studios, taking over labor unions for payoffs. He was also a driving force behind the development of the Las Vegas Strip, opening the Flamingo Hotel in 1946. On the night of June 20, 1947, he was shot dead through the window of his Beverly Hills home. No one was ever charged, and the murder remains unsolved. Heading back to the main foyer, down the first corridor left of the entrance, low on the right wall, is the crypt of cartoon producer Leon Schlesinger. In the early 1930s, he founded Leon Schlesinger Productions, which produced Looney Tunes and Merry Melody cartoons for Warner Brothers. Their first star was Bosco, who was never quite able to match the popularity of Disney's Mickey Mouse or Fleischer's Betty Boop. And so Schlesinger pulled together a talented team of animators, including Fritz Freeling, Bob Clampett, Chuck Jones, and Tex Avery, to develop new characters. In the years that followed, audiences were introduced to Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, and Bugs Bunny. With the popularity of these characters, Schlesinger's cartoons soon rivaled those of Disney, and in 1944 he sold his studio to Warner Brothers, which became Warner Brothers Cartoons. Known for having a lisp, it's been stated by some that Mel Blanc based his voices of Daffy Duck and Sylvester the Cat on Schlesinger. Continuing down this hall we reach another entrance. On the right, just below eye level, is the niche of composer Franz Waxman. Some of his notable film scores include The Bride of Frankenstein, Rebecca, and Rear Window. He won two Oscars in his career, For A Place in the Sun and Sunset Boulevard. So they were turning after all those cameras. Life, which can be strangely merciful, had taken pity on Norma Desmond. The dream she had clung to so desperately had enfolded her. Mm -hmm. 
That'll do it for this mausoleum, let's head outside. Following this sidewalk around to the north, across the street, we reach the Garden of the Exodus. Here we find the grave of Alan Crosland. He was a director in early Hollywood, noted for having directed Hollywood's first feature-length talking film, The Jazz Singer, in 1927. He died after a car accident on Sunset Boulevard in 1936. His grave remained unmarked for 67 years until a headstone was generously donated. In a world where the deep, gravelly-voiced man introduced you to the movies you couldn't wait to see, Don LaFontaine had the greatest voice of them all. <coughs> Excuse me. LaFontaine, whose nicknames included Thunderthroat and the Voice of God, defined the trailer sound and voiced more than 5,000 film trailers in his career, as well as countless TV ads and video game trailers. Once he was programmed to destroy the future. I don't know what it's like to try to kill one of these things. Now his mission, get down, is to protect it. At the western edge of this lawn, right against the road, we find another of Hollywood's legendary voices, Mel Blanc. He was known as the man of a thousand voices, and for good reason. Many of the 20th century's most beloved cartoon characters were voiced by Mel Blanc, including Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig, Sylvester, Tweety, Yosemite Sam, Foghorn Leghorn, Wile E. Coyote, and more. In fact, the only male character in the Warner Brothers world that he didn't voice was Elmer Fudd, voiced by Arthur Q. Bryan, who we visited in our tour of Valhalla. This ain't rabbit hunting season. It's not? No, it's duck hunting season. That, sir, is an investigated fabrication. It's rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. I say it's duck season, and I say fire. <laughs> He voiced characters from other studios as well, including Barney Rubble and Mr. Spacely, as well as Woody Woodpecker's Laugh. Blank is considered by many as the most prolific voice actor in Hollywood history, and was the first to receive on-screen credit. His epitaph is the line famously spoken by Blank as Porky Pig at the end of many Warner Brothers cartoons. Heading to the lawn just across the street to the west, just past a hedge, is the grave of Estelle Getty. She was an actress who portrayed one of TV's most beloved characters, Sophia Petrillo, on The Golden Girls from 1985 to 1992. The role earned her an Emmy and a Golden Globe. Picture it. Sicily, 1920. Seraphine and I were both crazy about Marco, the goat boy. In appearance, an Adonis. In behavior, Horny as a toad. <laughs> Little did I know he had a thing for hairy fat girls. <laughs> if I were fatter and hairier, Dorothy, Marco the Goat Boy could have been your father. Northwest on this same lawn, nearly hidden under a tall cypress tree, is the grave of Paul Mooney. He is perhaps best remembered for his lead role in the 1932 gangster film Scarface which is loosely based on the life of Al Capone. The film was an inspiration for the 1983 film of the same name, starring Al Pacino. Mooney became known as the new Lon Chaney for his ability to morph and disappear into his characters. Other notable roles include the story of Louis Pasteur, which earned him an Oscar. Let's head back to the road toward the intersection. You know what guys, there's a solar eclipse happening right now. Let's take a peek. Oops, forgot my solar glasses. Hang on. There we go. Damn, I wish we could see it a little better though. Let me try a different pair. Oh, look at that. Isn't nature magical? The sun is back, let's continue the tour. On the north side of this road, at the base of two tall trees, is Carl Alfalfa Schweitzer, the freckle-faced boy with the untamable cowlick from the R Gang short films of the 30s and 40s. Alfalfa was one of the series' most popular characters, and is remembered for singing off-key and being the love interest of Darla, who we visited in part one. Here he is, serenading Darla after unknowingly eating a soap sandwich.
After he outgrew the R Gang series, he worked as a professional dog breeder and hunting guide, hence the dog on his marker. He died from a gunshot wound during an altercation over money. He was 31. Straight north in this same section is the grave of Hollywood pioneer David Horsley. He founded the Centaur Film Company in New Jersey in 1907, the first independent motion picture studio in the United States. In order to take advantage of the year-round clement weather, he established a western branch of the studio, the Nestor Film Company, which in 1911 became the first film studio in Hollywood. In 1912, Nestor merged with Carl Lemley's Universal. Back to the road, continuing east, we arrive at the Douglas Fairbanks Lawn on the right. Here we find one of Hollywood's grandest memorials for two of its most legendary actors, Douglas Fairbanks and his son, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. A long reflecting pool leads to a marble sarcophagus surrounded by pillars. A bronze relief of the senior Fairbanks in profile sits above the inscription of their names on the wall. Before Clark Gable, Douglas Fairbanks was the original King of Hollywood and the first I do all my own stunts action hero superstar. While contemporaries like Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton used stunts to great comedic effect, audiences were enthralled by the athleticism of Fairbanks' stunts as the heroic swashbuckler. Some of his biggest hits include The Thief of Baghdad, Robin Hood, and The Mark of Zorro. He was one of the founding members of the Motion Picture Academy, and in 1919 formed United Artists with Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, and Mary Pickford, who would become his wife. Fairbanks and Pickford became Hollywood's first superstar couple, seen almost as American royalty. Their Beverly Hills estate Pickfair was the social hub of Hollywood during the 20s. Despite being one of the biggest stars of the 20s, his career waned at the dawn of the talkies, and his final film was 1934's The Private Life of Don Juan. Still, his legacy endured. His portrayal of Zorro inspired future superheroes like Superman and Batman. He died after a heart attack at just 56. His funeral was held at the Wee Kirk of the Heather Chapel at Forest Lawn Glendale. Fairbanks was originally entombed at a crypt in the Great Mausoleum at Forest Lawn, then moved here upon completion of this monument. It's very hard to read, but the inscription says, Good night, sweet princes, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Entombed here with his father is Douglas Fairbanks Jr. He followed in his father's footsteps, becoming an actor, and often playing the action hero, but was careful to never imitate the senior Fairbanks. He can be seen in films like The Prisoner of Zenda, Gunga Din, and Sinbad the Sailor. Doug Jr. was also a hero off-screen, enlisting in the Navy during World War II. He was awarded the Legion of Merit and various other awards for spearheading the Beach Jumpers, an amphibious unit that specialized in deception and psychological warfare. He died in 2000 at the age of 90. Back to the road, just east, is a memorial for one of Hollywood's favorite animal characters, Toto. Her real name was Terry, a Cairn Terrier, and she starred alongside Judy Garland in 1939's The Wizard of Oz. After her death in 1945, she was buried on her owner's ranch in Studio City. Her grave was destroyed during the construction of the Ventura Freeway. This memorial to her was placed here in 2011. A short distance east is the crypt of Mickey Rooney, one of the 20th century's most enduring and beloved entertainers. He began acting at the age of six, and within a year he had a starring role in a series of shorts called Mickey Maguire, which ran from 1927 to 1934, and often rivaled the popularity of the R Gang series. He rose to stardom in the 30s and 40s with his portrayal of all-American teenager Andy Hardy in over a dozen films. Hello folks, what'll it be? I want a chocolate soda with vanilla ice cream, please. Make it two, buddy. You bet. Yes, sir, there's something about a high-class ice cream soda that makes a fellow feel as though he's wasting time with meat and vegetables. Ain't it the truth? Hello, Cynthia. How do you do, Mr. Hardy? He also starred alongside Judy Garland in several musical films of the 30s, including Babes in Arms, a role which turned him an Oscar nomination, the first teenager to ever be nominated. He also shone in dramatic roles like Boy's Town with Spencer Tracy, and by the late 30s had become Hollywood's number one box office draw. He continued to entertain audiences throughout the century, 
in everything from Black Stallion to Night at the Museum. He was married eight times, including to actresses Ava Gardner and Martha Vickers. At the time of his death in 2014, at the age of 93, he was one of the last surviving vestiges of the silent era. Let's make our way now into the Cathedral Mausoleum. At the far end of the main foyer are a series of glass front niches. On the left, about at eye level, is the book-shaped urn of Eleanor Powell. She was a dancer and actress popular in the 30s and 40s. She was considered by many as the greatest tap dancer of the era, a skill which she showcased in films like Born to Dance and Broadway Melody of 1940 with Fred Astaire. Let's head back to the first corridor on the right. Near the end on the right is the niche of actor David White. Don't be creeped out by the bust, it's common practice for actors to have life masks taken, in this case for a prop. David is best remembered for his role as Larry Tate on the 60s TV series Bewitched. We'll have our brandy in the den, all right, Mr. Campbell? As long as it's brandy, we'll have it any place you choose. Dad? <laughs> Look! This is a surprise Andorra was talking about. Sam! I never realized I had such a beautifully shaped head. <laughs> He's entombed with his son, Jonathan, who was killed in the terrorist bombings of Pan Am Flight 103 in 1988. In the last corridor on the right, low on the wall, is the crypt of actor Peter Finch. He won an Academy Award for his role as Howard Beale in the 1976 film Network. He died in 1977, making the award posthumous. Ladies and gentlemen, the Network News Hour with Howard Beale. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. At the end on the left is one of the most legendary crypts in all of Hollywood that of the great lover of the silver screen, Rudolf Valentino. He was the original Latin lover and the greatest male sex symbol of the 1920s. He rose to fame in the 1921 film The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and later that year starred as the Sheik, the role that he became most closely identified with. Other hits include Blood and Sand and his last film, The Son of the Sheik. On August 15, 1926, Valentino collapsed at the Hotel Ambassador in Manhattan. He underwent emergency surgery for gastric ulcers, and though he and his doctors were optimistic, he died several days later of peritonitis. His untimely death at the age of 31 caused widespread hysteria among his legions of female admirers, some reportedly choosing to take their own life in their grief. Tens of thousands lined up at his funeral to catch a glimpse of the star, causing a near riot. Mourners included his fiancée, Paula Negri, who fainted several times at her dead lover's side. Valentino's body was then taken by train to Los Angeles. This crypt was donated to him by his friend, screenwriter June Mathis, and was meant only to be temporary, but plans for a memorial never materialized, and so here he remains. Every year, on the anniversary of his death, a mysterious woman in black would leave a rose at his grave, a tradition carried on by others today, including Carrie Bible. Next to Valentino was one of the great women of early Hollywood, June Mathis. She was a screenwriter who, by the age of 35, became the first female executive at MGM. Her first major success as a screenwriter was the 1921 film The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. She insisted on the casting of a then unknown Rudolph Valentino. The film was a hit, and she is credited for essentially discovering Valentino. 
they remained close friends until his death. Other notable scripts include Greed and Ben-Hur. By the mid-twenties she was considered one of the most influential women in Hollywood, alongside Mary Pickford and Norma Talmadge. She died just one year after Valentino, suffering a heart attack during the third act of a Broadway show. Let's head back to the main corridor, to the other side of the mausoleum. Here we find the crypt of William Desmond Taylor. He was a director in early Hollywood during the silent era, directing stars like Mary Pickford and her siblings Lottie and Jack. But it was Taylor's unsolved murder in 1922 that forged his place in Hollywood lore. His body was found in his apartment the morning of February 2nd, a bullet hole in his back. The investigation and trial became a media sensation, with some of Hollywood's biggest names embroiled in the scandal, including Mary Miles Minter and Mabel Normand, the last person to see him alive. While Mabel was ruled out as a suspect, her career was tarnished by the investigation through revelations of cocaine addiction. One theory was that Taylor's attempts to save Mabel from her addiction by bringing legal action against her dealers led to a contract killing by the drug dealers. Several actresses, including Margaret Gibson, reportedly made deathbed confessions to Taylor's murder. The case remains cold to this day, making his murder Hollywood's oldest unsolved mystery. At the end of the corridor behind Taylor are the crypts of Harvey and Daida Wilcox. Harvey owned a ranch west of Los Angeles in the 1880s. It was his wife, Ida, who decided to call the land Hollywood. They were originally interred at Rosedale Cemetery, but moved here in the 1930s. Finally, we head back down this hall, where low on the left, we find screen icon Peter Lorre. His career began in the 30s in Europe, becoming an international sensation for his terrifying performance as a psychopathic serial killer in Fritz Lang's M, a German expressionist film considered an early precursor of the noir genre. Immer, immer muss ich durch Straßen gehen, und immer spüre ich, da ist einer hinter mir her, das bin ich selber, und verfolgt mich. The rise of the Nazi party drove him to flee Germany, and soon he landed a role in Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much, learning English along the way. In Hollywood, he continued to shine in roles as criminal masterminds and sinister foreigners in films like The Maltese Falcon, Casablanca, and Mad Love. I, a poor peasant, have conquered science. Why can't I conquer love? <laughs> He shall be shut up when it's I who am mad. <laughs> but nobody knows that. Yes, each man kills the thing he loves. <laughs> He was friends with other horror icons of the era, like Vincent Price, Boris Karloff, and Bela Lugosi. Vincent Price read the eulogy at Laurie's funeral, referring to him as the most inventive actor I've ever known. Laurie's distinctive look and voice have often been imitated in everything from the Looney Tunes, Ren in Ren and Stimpy, and the Maggot in Corpse Bride. Go chew someone else's ear for a while. Victor has gone to see his parents. Just like he said. If I hadn't just been sitting in it, I would see that you had lost your mind. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. How about this old piano in the Bethel on Mausoleum? It's a thing of beauty. Curious what it sounds like? I sampled it on my phone. You want to hear? Take a listen. Oh.